Oh, you may be seated. I guess I don't. He's trying to take a deep breath. I didn't know I was in charge of that part. It's good to see a good turnout. I thought it would be better to be home watching the Browns. They're running 930 because they're over in London or something. They're trying to get the first win on foreign soil, I guess. But uh, you're, you're where you should be, right here in and it was, uh, they played, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? And that's what the lesson is going to be on. Um, the, the Lord uh, laid on my heart to give a, a study on the importance of the blood as it's found in the Bible. I, as, as I studied, I found I was going to have about three lessons. So I'm going to call it the Blood, tr blood Trilogy. So it'll be two more installments after this one. So let's begin in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I do give you praise and glory and honor and thank you for sending Jesus to Calvary to shed his precious blood for our sins so that we can have a home in heaven and not have to go to a devil's hell. Fill me with the spirit so I can teach your word today Lord and I pray somebody will be blessed and your name will be glorified. Lord just learn to, let's learn together in Jesus name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're all aware of the importance of the blood of Jesus Christ, saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin, a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved, my sins are a pardon, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. We've sung this hymn exuberantly throughout the years in spite of the fact that apostate churches with their modern bottle, <clears throat> modern day Bibles have watered down the blood and even taken it clear out, substituting it with the word death. And we know without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Um, let's go to Hebrews 4.12. This is a verse the pastor quotes quite frequently and rightfully so. Hebrews, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Satan knows the word of God is powerful, and he knows it's sharp too. He's been cut enough times by it. That's why it's no surprise to see so many different Bibles coming out. As these Bibles have been translated from perverted manuscripts and pawned off to the poor and suspecting public as the Word of God, in years gone by, the devil only used open-faced Bible haters to attack the Word of God. But God has become more subtle in his approach by inspiring men to create perverted Bibles. Satan has done that, such as the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the New English Bible, the Living Bible, and the and conglomeration of other Bibles that are even more corrupt than the Revised Standard Version. However, any corruption is totally corrupt anyhow, because uh, Galatians 5, 7 says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Many false preachers and apostate churches have sought Satan's lie, lie bought it hook, line, and sinker, for they have been mesmerized by scholarships that claim to be true doctrine. They have been led into error by Satan's subtlety. Unfortunately, they're on their way to hell, and they're going to take their congregation there with them. It's no surprise that Satan has chosen this method to get the authorized version of the King James 1611 out of the hands of the saved and the unsaved alike, for, you know, he knows that it is the true word of God. And it comes down to the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan, has worked much in the same way. In years gone by, the devil has used only open-faced blood haters to attack the blood of Christ, calling it a slaughterhouse religion. But today, Satan uses false preachers to claim that there is no saving power in the blood of Christ, that it is dried up, gone into the dust, and that it is not tangible in any form anywhere, and that certainly was not carried to heaven and placed on the mercy seat. If you were the devil 
and you knew the power of the word of God and you knew the power of the blood which is ultimately going to defeat you when you have handled it the way Satan handled it when you try to make more people believe through scholars that no one has the perfect infallible word of God since the originals faded cracked split disintegrated back into the dust when you use trusted so-called scholars to play down the blood and make people think that it has no part in salvation I think you're intelligent enough to know that's exactly what you would do if you were the devil. To this end, Satan's greatest foes, other than the Almighty God Himself, are the Word of God and the blood of the Lamb. Go to Hebrews 9.22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. The Webster Dictionary defines the word remission as to forgiveness or pardon. So without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness or pardon. Also go to Leviticus 17.11, the third book of the Old Testament. Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The Webster Dictionary defines the word atonement as to make amends for wrongdoing. What makes atonement for the soul? The blood. So what makes atonement for the soul today? The blood of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's look at the Last Supper. Go to Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What does remission mean again? To forgive, to pardon, and who shed blood brings forgiveness for our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God, I got under the preaching of an old-fashioned King James Bible preacher who preached to me that the Lord Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation. Jesus said that himself in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given by men whereby we must be saved. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And in addition, his precious blood is the only element in existence that could cleanse my sins for not redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and spot. So as a lost, hell-bound sinner, I was in desperate need for forgiveness and atonement before God and for my transgressions against him. I found out that Jesus Christ himself is the atonement for my sins. Later in these lessons, as I progressed in the blood trilogy, I hope to convey that the literal blood that came from the literal body of Jesus Christ and stained the literal cross was carried literally by Jesus into a literal heaven and sprinkled on the literal mercy seat. And if it were not literally there, there would be no salvation for our literal sinners, and we'd go to a literal hell without hope. But for now, I'm going to change directions a little bit. And have you ever pondered, uh, has God always required a blood sacrifice for, for the forgiveness of sin? Let's take a look at Adam and Eve. Go to Genesis 2, 15 through 17.
And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the story goes on to tell how God created a woman for the man and pronounced a man and wife. No sooner that the marriage had been consummated, the devil showed up. He caught Eve alone and tempted her to disobey God. Eve succumbed gave also the forbidden fruit to her husband, and Adam and Eve fell. Please notice what Adam and Eve did immediately after they had disobeyed God and sinned against him. Go to Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. They knew that they sinned against God. Go down to verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Please note, most people accept in the cool of the day as meaning is in the early morning. However, the cool of the day may be understood as the spirit of the day, as the Hebrew word for cool is the same as for spirit. The day is a judgment day in this context. Let's continue Genesis 3, 9 through 13. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? And, and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. You know, when the first human pair had sinned against God, they did two things. First, they tried to cover up their nakedness before God by putting on fig leaf aprons. Then they tried to hide themselves from acknowledging that their intimate fellowship had been broken. You realize God always seeks out man in the sense that he solicits a response from his creation now separated from him by sin. God called Adam, where art thou? God knew exactly where Adam was for God's omniscience. He's omnipresent. God was only seeking Adam's response. Secondly, they tried to justify themselves before God by playing the blame game. Adam blamed the woman and God. Since God was the one who brought her to Adam, Eve was beguiled by the serpent. However, she did not take responsibility for eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Blame shifting is another evasive tactic employed by fallen man and still applies today. I'm going to go down a short rabbit trail here. Instinctively, innately, we human beings know that there's a God. There's no such thing as a true atheist. Every man knows God exists and, and that he is holy God who will pour out his wrath against him for his sins. Whether he ever saw the Bible or not, every man knows this. God says so. Go to Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the, wrath, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the, the, for the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, be understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead so that they are without excuse. According to the, to the God who created us, atheists and agnostics are liars. And what's the difference between an atheist and an agnostic anyhow? Well, atheists believe there's no God. Agnostics, one who believes it's impossible to know if 
God exists. So according to the God who created us, atheists and agnostics are liars. They do know God exists because he has manifested the very fact in them, and by doing has showed them that he exists. Like you and me, they also know that there are sinners before for God. And who also is the father lies, Satan, right? And he's, and he's got these atheists and agnostics blinded to the gospel truth. In addition, God's creation of the universe shows he exists. An all-powerful and intelligent God is an adequate cause to explain the universe. Uh, go to John 1.9. Not everybody thinks First John 1, 9, because that's, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. But John 1, 9 is an important verse, too, as all the Bible verses are. John 1, 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Lighteth every man means that God's revelation is universally available. It doesn't signify universal salvation, however, but to this end, atheists and agnostics are without excuse. No man is able to stand before God and say that he has turned away from God because God did not give him any light. All men have had the revelation of God, therefore all men are accountable to him. Since we all know that God exists and that he hates our sin, we try to cover up our guilt and attempt to justify ourselves in our sin. The only problem is that we can't justify himself before, before God. It's absolutely impossible. We learn this very quickly when we look at what happened back in the beginning when man sinned against God. Did you note earlier that even though Adam and Eve had clothed themselves in the fig leaf aprons, they knew in the sight of God that they were still naked. Remember Adam said unto God, I heard a voice in the garden, I was afraid because I was naked. So what did God do? Go to Genesis 3.21. We're going to have to go to Genesis, Revelation, Genesis, and that's a quick way of getting through the whole Bible, but... Genesis 3.21, so what did God do? Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. To this end, Adam and Eve needed a covering for their nakedness, which God provided in his way, for blood had to be shed to do it. It would be pretty difficult to get the skin off an animal without the shedding its blood. In doing this, God was teaching all of us a lesson. There is no way we can cover our own sin nakedness before God. He has to do it for us, and it has to be done by the blood. Let's now take a look at Cain and Abel. Go to Genesis 4, 1 through 5. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. What was Abel's flock made of anyhow? Sheep, right? Abel brought a lamb because his parents had taught him it was the only way to approach God. They knew it because they saw what kind of animal had to die so they could be clothed. The firstlings of the flock refers to the fact that Abel's offering was accepted because it was a blood sacrifice based on previous knowledge that God made coats of skins for both his parents, their parents. Thus he acknowledged that his sin deserved death and could be covered only by the death of a guiltless sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Many people ask me, why didn't God accept Cain's offering? He, he gave the best he had. Truly so. Cain might have been sincere in giving the fruit of the ground as an offering to the Lord. However, he was sincerely wrong. God's a sovereign God. He makes the rules. What he says we, what we must do, we must do. Romans, or, um, Psalm 119, 
105 says the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God tells us what to do in his word, and we must stay obedient to his word as he gives us guidance and direction in life. Cain was disobedient to God and brought the wrong offering. His fruits of his labor was rejected because it represented his self-effort or good works to appease God. To this end, Abel brought of the fat of the sheep. And you can't get the fat without the shedding of blood. He was pleased because Abel was showing his faith in God's promise that a deliverer who would come to earth one day and that deliverer would come as the Lamb of God. Go to Revelation 13.8. We'll see that. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Christ's redemptive blood shed, shedding death for mankind was part of God's plan from eternity past. You know, God was so pleased with Abel's faith offering that that he put him in the face hall of fame. And you can, you know, we know that's in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 4 says... By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, a blood sacrifice. But God was not pleased with Cain's offering of vegetables reflecting good works. And Cain is in hell of the stay because he tried to. And you can find that. We're going to look at this later on. You don't have to turn now. Jude verses 11 through 13. There's only one chapter. And um, we'll look at that later on in the lessons. And we too will end up in hell by trying to get to heaven by our good works. You can't do it. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. No man will ever see heaven and no one will ever miss hell unless they're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood still lose all their guilty stains. Now let's take a look at Abraham and Isaac. Go to Genesis 22 verses 6 and 7. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham carried two things in his hands, fire and a knife. And the knife was to be used for slaying Isaac. It was plain enough that there was going to be bloodshed. The fire would be used to set Isaac's body ablaze after he was dead. Isaac, of course, had not been told that he was the intended victim. Observing the knife in his father's hand and the fire he carried, the young man felt the weight of the wood on his back and looked around saying, Daddy, I see the fire and I see the wood, but where's the lamb to be offered? Now let's look at Abraham's response. Go to verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And sure enough, as you read on in the story, God did provide a lamb to be offered in the place of Isaac. The lamb's blood was shed instead of Isaac's. Many can't fathom that a loving God could tempt Abraham in such a cruel way. God did tempt Abraham. However, the verb tempt is better rendered as proved or tested. God does not tempt anyone with evil. Let's take a look at that. James chapter 1 verses 13 through 15.
Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away with, of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So God does not tempt anyone with evil. However, he does test or try or prove us. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 to see this. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perished, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ." In context of the verses we just read, we can see that God's command to sacrifice Isaac was not evil, for God knew what he would do in the end. He had no intention to permit the murder of Isaac, once again, in God's omniscient, as he knows everything. In addition, though Abraham may not have been aware of it, he was actually speaking a prophecy when he made the statement in Genesis 20. 2.8 it says, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself as a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, emphasizing on the word himself. This is exactly what happened. God himself became the supreme sacrificial lamb. The Lord Jesus is God. He is a also the lamb. God did provide himself as the lamb. If it had been anyone else, the bloodshed and the sacrifice himself would not have been sufficient to redeem us back from the penalty of our sin and from the wrath of God. It had to be a stainless, sinless, spotless, spotless blood to satisfy God. And there's only one person who had that kind of blood, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Ephesians 1.7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the, his riches, uh, according to the riches of his grace. Now let's take a look at the Passover. Remember when, when the children of Israel were held captive by Pharaoh in Egypt and let them go back to Israel, Israel and God kept sending the plagues one by one. And, uh, but the final plague was designated, get the children of Israel out of Egypt and back home to Israel. Go to Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginnings of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a mill of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side post and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Go ahead and go to verses 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. 
you know, the annual feast of the Passover commemorated the birth of the nation of Israel and, and her deliverance from Egypt. Uh, typologically, it pointed forward to a greater deliverance from the bondage of sin to be provided by the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. And if you have the blood of Jesus upon your heart, God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And when John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the nation, he recognized Christ as the fulfillment of the typical Passover lambs. John 1.29 quotes, The next day John sees Jesus coming into him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now let's continue in Ex Exodus 12.29-30 and let's look where the Lord executed his judgment. 20, verses 29 and 30. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on the throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And, the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. The blood of the lamb without blemish and spot on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses is a perfect picture of Jesus Christ, you know, the Lamb of God. You know, like when you ask Jesus in your heart to be your personal Savior, he'll come in and put his blood upon the doorpost of your heart. And when God the Father looks down upon you, he don't see your vile, wicked sins, but he sees the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and spot, for we're not redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and spot. But to this end, it is vividly apparent that God has always required a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin, and that it was made evident in the lives of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Abraham and Isaac, and also the event of the Passover. For it's the blood is the essential element required for the forgiveness of sin. Why? I'm going to read 11, uh, Leviticus 17, 11 once more. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make atonement for the soul. Um, you know, blood sacrifice for sin was also required in the tabernacle or the mobile temple. And we're going to look here what God told Moses to instruct the children of Israel to do. Go to Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. And I want to thank Dave Macarola and some of these verses right here. He helped me with an ant. It's good to talk scripture over with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's a, it's Exodus 25, 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So within the tabernacle, a veil divided the holy place from the most holy place. Let's look at the mercy seat which was in the most holy place. Go to Exodus 25, 17 through 22. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and the cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all the th things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. The mercy seat is derived from the root word meaning to cover, to conceal, thus represent a covering for sin. And the verb is derived from a noun meaning ransom, 
since it's parallel to the word redeem. And the testimony within the ark quite de clearly designates the two tables of stone, which are the Ten Commandments. And the Lord would commune with the high priest from above the mercy seat, from be between the two cherubims, which were upon the ark of the testimony. In addition, there was uh, some safeguards to ensure the sanctity of the most holy place. Let's look at that. Go to Leviticus 16, 1 and 2. We're almost uh, to the end here for today. Leviticus 16, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Wow, Aaron's two sons both died for not obeying proper procedure when they offered before the Lord, proper holy dress, proper proper sacrifice had to be used at the proper time. Within verse 2, it said, Aaron was not to come at all times into the holy place within the veil. The high priest was allowed to enter the holy place once a year and not to come whenever he chooses, not at all times. The reason Aaron could not enter the holy place is that it housed the ark in which the mercy seat was found. This was where God came to his people in the heart of the tabernacle hidden in the cloud. So if Aaron did not enter only when God prescribed, he would have died too. In addition, Aaron would have to make an atonement for himself and for his own house before he could offer a sin offering for Israel. Go to verses 11 14 here in Leviticus 16 verses 11 and 14 and Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and he shall take the censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not and he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his fingers seven times notice what did Aaron sprinkle before the mercy seat blood but it was sprinkled specifically in accordance to God's instruction now since Aaron made the atonement for himself and for his own house he was now allowed to make a sin offering for Israel go one more verse down Levit Leviticus sixteen fifteen. Then shall we kill the goat of the sin offering that is before the people and bring his blood within the veil and do, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Notice once again, what did Aaron sprinkle upon and before the mercy seat for a sin offering for Israel? Blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Um, I think I'm going to end here, but next time we're going to bounce around the book of Hebrews for a while on that. Um, hopefully the subject matter won't be quite as dry, but I'm going to give you something to ponder for the next lesson. Um, why do we no longer sacrifice animals to obtain their blood for the forgiveness of sins? So let's end in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I do give you praise and glory and honor. And I, I pray that we all got a better understanding of your word through the scriptures that we went over today. And, Anna, and thank you for giving me the ability to, to, to bring them out, Lord. I, I, I can't do anything outside you. And um, I thank you for those that did go down to Youngstown the other day uh, and took the John and Romans. I've prayed fell on good ground, and I pray that uh, souls were one. I pray for that officers Leo, too, that in the family and the friends that uh, 
You give comfort, peace, hope, and strength that only you can do. And I thank you for our pastor, too. I, I believe he feeds the flock. He's a good example of the flock. He watches over our souls. And one day he's going to get that crown of glory that's promised. And, and I think he will. So I pray we can have a good pastor appreciation day today. And not only this, Lord, I pray today that the Holy Spirit starts pricking and prodding and tugging on somebody's heart's door that they can receive Jesus Christ in their heart as their personal Savior and the blood can be applied to their heart today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.